Welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Spencer Locker. And myself, Scott Morrison. Oh, Scott, how are you doing, man? I'm very well, said. So what have you been up to recently, man? Um, I've just come back from a couple of days away mm. with an organisation looking at leading the team. Uh, it went very well, some great energy, some great questions, some great sort of mindset towards how they're looking to improve their situation as leaders, yeah. as influencers, as managers, if you like. So um, two days well spent with uh, what I would class as a, a very forward-thinking, staff-oriented organisation. I'm, I'm a big fan of them. Good. It, it makes such a difference when they bring the energy, doesn't it? Yeah. I, I went uh, A couple of weeks ago, I went out with a client. I did three days on the bounce with them. And uh, there was nothing wrong with the first two days. Nothing wrong with it at all. They were really nice people. Mm. The third day was magnificent right. because they brought the energy. You know, straight away before they even sat down in the morning, you thought this is going to be a it's good a day. It's thing, isn't it? Some sort of that uncertainty of what am I getting from today? Who's the person I'm with? What's the team dynamic? Yeah. As that trust builds, it, it builds to a big crescendo, yeah. if you like. So now they're fully comfortable. They know who you are. Oh, no, no, no. These were three different groups. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so this yeah. separate group just yeah. came with a different... Yes, very much right. so, yeah. So, so the first two were, were great. They were nice people, but they were low reactors. Right. The third group, incredible, just brought the energy. I was buzzing before I even started. Yeah. So, yeah, I love that. I think, to be honest with you, uh, many of us in the world use nudge theory, particularly as parents. Okay. We we use it sort of judiciously, but I don't think we some we sometimes don't or we fail to recognise it when it's being used again. Not against us, but on us. but yeah, on us within our environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So so I think that. Um, the, the the concept of nudge theory, when uh, there's going to be people out there that go, yeah, I know about nudge theory, and there's going to be some people out there that go, well, I don't. When when we start thinking about nudge theory, the, the beginnings of it, sure. or the recognition of it, I suppose, it was, let me just, because I've got to get these names right. So uh, Richard Thaler and uh, Cass Sunstein, uh, and they brought out a book in 2008 called Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Mm -hmm. So this was sort of, from a from a a concept from a healthcare concept about um, generally about people who've, who're suffering from chronic situ uh, chronic illnesses chronic conditions um, and recognizing that human beings tend to follow the path of least resistance sure um, they don't necessarily like being told what to do but in certain aspects they do like being told what to do uh, so if we give these people choices and bearing in mind we're talking about health lifestyle well-being if we can give them choices but get it so that they will we, we will encourage them yeah to take the choices we think are best mm -hmm. for them so they still think they're making the choices but actually it's a stacked deck yeah, but it's still beneficial. Yeah, there's no uh, there's no sort of evil thing, purpose living in the background of this. The theme it's, is always best practice and with yeah. best intention, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's basically what we're sort of looking at with with, with nudge theory. So just just to sort of give that. I talked about Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Um, they did this, uh, and uh, off the back of that, lots of people picked up on it. So. Uh, around politics at the time, we had uh, we had the um, conservatives, and they picked up on this sort of nudge theory about right, okay, then so how we can play, how can we play with a stacked deck uh, sure. with, without from a political perspective and not necessarily from a health and well being perspective. So they started sort of creating nudge units. That sounds special, doesn't it? <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. So nudge units, shaping policy, party politics and agenda. So obviously these nudge units, if there's a, a party in, in power, yeah. well, they're going to have an agenda, are they? Well, yeah, yeah. you'd like to think so. That's the um, so, so obviously they're try going to try and nudge people in the direction of what they want. Well, now that starts coming into freedom of choice. So yes, you're giving people the freedom of choice, but ethically speaking, if you're playing with a load of deck, they're going to, whatever choice they make, is going to benefit you and your agenda because you're in power, yeah. And I suppose that's it. That's that's something that we we could actually talk about a little bit later on. Ethics. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've got a view on that. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you on it. Yeah. How how are you impacting on these people? Um, how can you how can you look at nudge theory and sort of take things and go right? I could use that in my business because I'm sure you'll agree with me. When we tend to work with people, uh, groups, 
let's say, lower to middle managers, uh, there's a tendency to feel a little bit powerless. Sure. Uh, things are happening to me, change is happening to me. Uh, why is it we always change? It's not broken, it works. Yeah. So, okay, so how can we take this concept of nudge theory and apply it in different areas? Okay. What are your thoughts on that? Any thoughts? I think we, you know, we talk about leadership styles, don't we? Yeah. Um, and we can use the influence of, say, collaborative as an example. Mm. So we talk about collaborative as uh, an advantage to the leader in in town. So yeah. if I lead a team of 10 as an example, yeah. and we're about to engage on a new project, a change project, yeah. I could have my own ideas, but ultimately I could put that out to the group as come with your best self, come with your best ideas, ways forward, ways of thinking. Now, I think when, whenever I do this sort of session with with cohorts, et cetera, from different variants of public, private, and sports, whichever way. Whenever I ask the question, I start this session with, are you the person when asked for ideas, you fly out the traps and you, you want to throw everything out there? Or are you the other person who likes to hear the the blueprint or the, the talk track of the leader of the room to mm. see if you're on point with what they're thinking? Now, nine out of 10 tend to go with, Will you go first, and then I'd like to influence that myself. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I think if you're aware of that as a leader, that people have their own agendas and their own views, and they're because, again, whether they know it or not, they're about to implement their version of a nudge, hmm. right? Hmm. So you can go in there and you can, you can say, right, well, we've got A option, we've got B option, and we've got C option as an organization. Now, starting on that platform, which way do we go? Now, already I've stacked my deck. I'm going to know where A takes me, to B takes me, C takes me. But ultimately, the room in question now sits there and go, oh, which do I prefer? I'll go with C. Mm. And it can go to a vote and you're democratic and you work out which group you go on because of the answers and the questions. But ultimately, I've already made that. De- I've not already made that de- decision, but I've influenced the motion. Does so, yeah, and, and you're doing this in the sense that Whichever option that these people choose mm-hmm. is for the is, is good with the organization. So, but but the fact is that you're actually because your deck is stacked. Yeah. Whichever option they pick is mm-hmm. going to benefit the organization. However, the win here is that you're getting buy-in because they feel they were part of the decision-making process. And as a result of being part of the decision-making process, the gauge commitment. Yeah. Now, if yeah, you yeah. get commitment, we all know what comes next. Yeah, yeah. Accountability. Yeah. And we're all in the game. So. We can earn it that way. So yeah, so there's there's a little view of how things can work. There's, there's there's millions of them, and you know, you talk about experience in the past. You know, my jobs as a as a retail manager is an example. Mm. Yeah, so this this nudge theory we used to use it all of the time. Right. And so yeah, this is what's this is this is the bit because because sales has never been my bag. Yeah, it's not something that I'm massively experienced in at all. So this is the this is the gold bit for me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. I mean, if we go right back to my early career, we see and we explain, you know, our, our experiences and stuff. So if I go back to where my career started as a as a young toddler, if you like, in the in the early days of being eighteen to twenty one, we used to talk a lot in sales and retail about yeah. where we go, what we do, and how we do it. So as an example, and um, you know, everybody waits for sales, right? Sales, I worked in retail, everyone works sales. I was fortunate in my in my youth to work in probably two of the most prominent sports stores in the town, in the area that everyone thought was trendy. Exact example, I used to manage the stores. So if ever I was given a process to deliver a sale, if I was honest, I wouldn't follow the routine of the organization. I'd follow what was needed for the store. Yeah. So you would have a, a branded function of what you would do. I wouldn't do that. I would literally just put, the sale banner in the window, the bottom of the window, I take everything out the window, put three mannequins in there with sale t-shirts. That is it. Smart mm. curiosity. Okay, there's a sale and when. They'd walk it. Now, the branded selection would be to have sale at the front of the store. My choice would be to remove it from the front of the, front of the store and put it at the back of the store. Right. I do that, Spence. I'm guessing, and, and please don't strike me down if I'm wrong, but the journey to the back of the store... Um, brings me into contact with the other things that aren't necessarily in the sale. Absolutely. So I'm now viewing everything. Because if I don't see anything that I like at the front of that store, boom, I take a view and I'm out. Mm. So I don't want that. I want them all the way to the back of the store. So when people are walking through the store, they're looking, 
There's lots of people at the back of the store. It looks busy. It looks active. What's going on in there? Bang. And they bring people in. But ultimately, like you say, it brings them through my full floor of sales goods, my luxury items at full price, and takes them into a narrow corridor mm. of where my sale items are. Right. So that would be the function of that. Okay. Yeah. Now, you can even go into the next level of that scenario is when they buy this product, how do I, how do I position it? How do I put it out there? So do I surround it with all my luxury items that are at full price to either draw attention to the luxury items at full price? Or does that full price then make the sale look more appealing because it's a bigger saving? Mm. So again, benefits for both sides. Yeah, yeah. And then once they've made the decision, you've tried them on, you've got the sizes, etc. to come to the till. Then what do I have in the till? I have all my tap, a smaller item. Right, okay. A smaller item that cost a pound, badges, laces, shoe laces, shoe cleaner, all of that good stuff. And you've just made a £30 saving on £150 shoes. Yeah. You want to look after them, right? right? Now I'm not selling to the kid. Who am I selling to? The parent. Yeah. You want them to look after that. Yeah. £3.50. Yeah. So this is a bit similar to the, uh, I spent 50 quid online. It's free shipping for 70 quid and over. What can I buy? For another £20. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, do I buy for another £20 to save myself £3 on yeah. shipping? Yeah. But they do it. Yeah. Because they sit there and think, how do I do that? And yeah. I, I, I mentioned earlier on that my boys has recently sent spending their Christmas money on various stuff. Yeah. And the, the oldest of the two at home, Jude, was like, I only need to spend £15, I think the amount was, mm. to get free shipping, Dad. And I'm like, right. So I said, how much have you spent so far? It tells me the amount. And I went, well, the shipping's three pound, buddy. So don't worry about spending the 15 pound. You know, save me mm. money. It's only three pound. You're 12 pound up. Mm. Didn't grasp it. But no, no, if I buy one more, I get something free. Mm. So didn't grasp it. So I said, I'll tell you what we'll do. You keep the 15 pound. I'll pay for the shipping. Mm. But I'll give you the three pound it would have cost you for sweets. Instant gratification. I'll take the sweets and I'll go. I had to change his idea of, Spending fifteen pound to save three. Yeah. So, so I, th- I suppose from a from a nudge perspective, when he says um, free shipping on seventy pounds or over, yeah, that's giving you a nudge to to spend seventy pounds. Uh, so, uh, whereas you could be buying something fifty quid, and actually, if you just bought that, it cost you fifty three quid. Yeah. But but seventy quid bargain chicken dinner. It yeah. looks good, and then it's the same with the scenario. So you take sale out of there because not everywhere is in sale. So there's one of them for sale, but. One of the key things is we used to sell luxury sports goods. The idea there is what's the best thing to get them on shirt? Sure. Mm-hmm. Eye level. Right. Everything at eye level. So I put everything at five foot. I do a double layer of it. So my 150 pound trainers, if you like, are all laid in a double track across the center of the store. Mm. Why? They're easy to reach. I can get them. I can look at them. We can handle them. I can put them back. The vision. Yeah. If they're up top, if they're down below, they're either crouching down, getting on their hands and knees, or they're asking someone for help. No one wants to ask people for help because it draws in attention. Right. So this this brings me to something out something I read quite recently about um, cutting down on friction. Okay. Uh, because as human beings, uh, we tend to um, follow the path of least resistance. Sure. So you're saying, if I can see it, oh, that's good, I'll, I'll get that. Whereas if I've got to bend down and stand on my tiptoes, that's a little bit of friction. That's something else I've got to do. Yeah. So the path of least resistance yeah. just works for people because we've all got busy lives. And as you said there, you want to buy a pair of trainers, you've got a set budget, you walk into a shop, you look at a pair of trainers at eye level. I like them a bit more than I want to spend, but I'll do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the crazy thing about us as humans is, is that if I'm in a store and I see something for my my luxury gorgeous item i really want it but it's outside of my price rate yeah and then i look up to the top Mm. and i see the price that i can get but to get that shoe down i have to call the assistant over yeah they're going to talk to me yeah get me to try it on get me there's a difference now yeah because again i can handle this i'm in control and there's a feel as though they're not going to do the other side so it's silly things but it's enough to make people go with the path of life resistance it's Mm. easy to take it so yeah Okay, cool. And again, when we start talking about, as, as you've said there, um, we've got the, you've got luxury items, you've got bargain items. If you sell a bargain item, well, actually, you've, 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 you've sold a bargain item, they still benefit you, but you can position it according to your client base with actually, you've got, the, the, this is the budget option, this is the luxury option. However, we've got a middle ground. Yeah, and that might be the thing that you're actually trying to sell yeah. rather than this budget stuff and the, 
Yeah. Yeah. So now when we start looking at um, getting people to buy in on ideas, when we're trying to look at change, Mm. facilitating change, when we're looking at stakeholders who may very well be not necessarily uh, that sort of passionate about change or or change within the organization, how are you going to sell them that change? Because that's what it is, isn't it? It's selling them, Mm. selling them that change. So what are you going to do is you're going to put three things up there that you want to sell. Yeah. Um, and you're going to position it so that whichever one they choose, well, actually, is going to benefit us. Obviously, there is a preferred option, mm-hmm. uh, and that might be very, might very well be the middle ground bit. Um, but if they choose for that, yeah, you get what you want, but you're also getting the buy-in. Yeah, the buy-in from the from the stakeholder. So when this change moves forward, when this 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 um, strategy within the business starts moving forward, they're sat there going. I was part of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, you've got commitment, accountability, yeah. and you've got less friction because you know what? Every time you go to that particular person for something, they feel part of it rather than you didn't rather, like it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they feel they feel as though they're, they're they're driving the change rather than being dragged along with it. It's yeah. That simple. I made a couple of notes here earlier on. We cannot control our exposure to nudges, nor the way they affect. It has been argued that they curtail our basic freedom of choice. So, yeah, I think this is the thing is you can tell people that it's the best thing, but do they believe you? Um, for one of one of these things, I, I, I was reading an article, and, and please, I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but it was actually talking about type 2 diabetes, which that's a, a condition that I, I, I have myself. Um, but one of the things was about telling people about lifestyle changes that could vastly affect the um, the level of type 2 diabetes they've got. I mean, when I say level of type 2, is type 2 diabetes, yeah. yes or no? But vastly um, but your yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, so if you, if, you, um, if you embrace these changes, actually that will reduce the chances of you losing a leg. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, what do you want to do? So, oh, well, you've got to give up smoking. Yep, okay, I'll give up smoking. Right, and um, you've got to exercise a little bit. Yeah, okay, I'll exercise a little bit. And uh, you've got to cut down on your sugar intake. Mm. What does that look like? <laughs> um, well, you've got to eat less biscuits. Yeah. Sorry, biscuits are life. So you, you, you're telling them that, say, and you know what, smoking, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Yeah, okay, exercise, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Biscuits, though. Yeah, don't push Yeah, it's your gym. And yeah, you're asking a bit much there, aren't you? So, so now... We've got these people, you're telling them that actually, do you want to keep your leg or not? Because yeah. if you do, you've got to sort of, this is, you got to, I've got to. So you're telling me, you're not advising me now. Yeah. yeah. So when we start talking about human beings following the path of least resistance, but there's always that fundamental aspect of choice. Yeah. Right. So are you advising me? Are you giving me options? Are you telling me that I've got to do this? Because if you're telling me, yeah, you're going to push back at it. Don't tell me what to do. My, my dad, my dad had a great saying, and I, I got it as a younger boy off him often when I was too direct in my speech. Yeah, and he'd often just look at me and go, "Are you asking me or telling me?" And that changed the whole dynamic of how I would ask that same thing because you was never telling your dad anything. Yeah, so you you would change your speech to, "Oh, I'm asking," and this is what I'm asking, if that makes sense. So, but like you say, if somebody gives me uh, an ultimatum. If you do that, we're not doing the other. Or if you do that, you can't have. I will instantly go against. My football team that I selected as a child Mm. was in rebellion to being a Liverpool or Man United fan because that's who I was told I must follow to be part of this football team as a young kid. And I was absolutely, I won't do it. And now I support a team that's not won a trophy for so long and has been the bane of my existence forever. But (laughs) I will stick by them. Because of that, I had I not had that ultimatum, mm. I may well have been a different football team's fan. Does it, that make sense? It certainly uh, does, yeah. Yeah, so we, yeah. we do go into, if you're telling me, yeah, there, there could be a, an action as, a, as an accordance to a will or a won't. So we can start looking at, well, pushing people or nudging people. Yeah. So you're going to push people and tell them they've got to do this. You're going to nudge people and sort of say, well, this is a good idea, but we've got the choice of this or this. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. So, yeah, we can see that when we're trying to sell a change, when we're trying to sell a, a, a situation in work, well, it's better to nudge than push because if you get the push, you're going to have some people who will go with that push, but you've also got a certain amount of people who are going to push back. Yeah, we, we talk about us as humans, we tend to potentially make decisions that aren't always great for us, wrong choices. Yeah. 
And I think that's a big part of, like you said, the, the book, the nudges, where it comes into play to, to help us or suggest to us there are better options for us to take. And, and that's kind of the, the, the reason for that way of thinking by the two authors you mentioned earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not, not straying too far from nudge, but, but very much related to what you're saying there. I'm a firm believer that where we are in our lives as individuals, mm -hmm. so you yeah. and me and Tom, hi Tom, hi, Tom. Uh, <laughs> you and me and Tom, we, there are two reasons why we are where we are in our lives. The choices we made and the opportunities that have been afforded to us. Yeah. That's just it. Okay. So, and, and, and as avid listeners or readers or subscribers, love you, don't forget that, um, they, uh, they can look, they can sit back and they can reflect on that and go, right, okay, so, right, so opportunities that have afforded us, right, okay, so those opportunities may have been good opportunities, may not have been good opportunities, but ultimately, with them, you made choices to go one way or the other. Sure. It's like a sliding door sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You walk through a door, do I turn left or do I turn right? And that can fundamentally affect the rest of your life. Agreed. If you'd have turned left, it could have ended up totally different if you were to any turn right. However, the choices you made and the decisions, the decisions, uh, the opportunities that are given you. So, yeah, that's really interesting when we start thinking uh, from a team organizational perspective, opportunities that are afforded you, choices that you make. Right, you've got an opportunity here. We're, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. But to sort of encapsulate it a little bit, mm. it's that internal locus of control. I'm making decisions. The, the things are not happening to me. Life isn't happening to me. Yeah. I'm happening to life. Yeah. And I'm and you get that certain level of control and and it works. Yeah. If you recognize it. But yeah, and this is it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um moving on, the uh these seven that I sort of put down, uh, the T2 nudge theory um where it comes to positive organizational change. So um this is basically we're using this nudge theory or, or something close to nudge theory to try and influence positive or positive change within the organization. So the first one I, I, I thought of, and I don't know whether you agree with this, is clearly define the change. Yeah. Yeah? So we've got to look at what the change is, mm -hmm. why the change is happening. It may be that... Um, I think that that might come, that even though that's very important, it doesn't necessarily work in the same order. So it may very well, because I've actually got here, um, number two is include stakeholders in the change analysis and implementation. So if we're looking at change analysis and implementation, it's before we actually apply, imply, apply it. Yeah. Yeah. So if we're going to do that, well, actually, when you clearly define what the change is to, to the organization, people within the organization have already had a say in what it is. But the say that the decisions they've made and the influence that they're having within that chat, you've already constructed through to, through your nudge thing. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So you've given them options, but any option they choose is going to benefit you, but you've got a preferred option and you probably nudge them towards that anyway. Yeah. Is it, yeah. Just, just to, to bring that in. So it's essentially, there's there could be 10 decisions that you've come up with as an example of 10 options. Yeah. What benefit the most? What of least benefit, mm -hmm. which is going to be the path, the path of least resistance versus that in the opposite? Yeah. How is it going to be hard? How they're going to react to that? How's that going to impact the team, etc.? So as a result, you may have already taken a few of those options out of play yeah. because of now understanding mm -hmm. what we need to benefit as a result of that change that's in, yeah. in play. So yeah. we now give them those options. And that actually brings us on to number three, which is use evidence to support best options and set a timeline. Mm -hmm. So you will use that uh, those those ev that evidence judiciously, won't you? Yes. So there may be favoured um, favoured things that you will sort of stack up on the ones that you want to push. Yeah. Um, not this isn't lying or deceit, but the thing is the the other things you may very well sort of expound their shortcomings. Yeah. It might be it might be plain to see. Um, it might just be that there's not that many options, mm -hmm. but you're putting options on the table just to sort of demonstrate that these other things that other people might think of are no, non-starters. And as humans, I think one of the one of the things we make decisions on is that that first or that initial piece of information we're given. Mm. So as I know, a lot of people will make a decision on that first piece of evidence they've ever been given. I might just leave it at that as an example. I might not might not give them everything. I might give them enough for them to see that as the benefit to move things forward. Right. Okay. Because that's part of our psyche. We do that naturally. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah. Number four, don't force behavioural changes. Present it as a choice, which I think we've sort of explained there, really. Um, and, and again, when we start talking about the internal and external locus of control, if you're telling people to do things, then you're going to have a certain level of people going to turn around and go, oh, is that right, is it? Yeah. Oh, I'm going to do that, am I? <laughs> so, um, yeah, when we, uh, I think um, I heard something on the telly the other day, actually. Um, you catch more with honey than vinegar. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I'm sure there's a, there's a specific thing you catch more of. can't remember what it is. But you catch more something with honey than vinegar. Yeah. So uh, your honey is that presenting as a choice. Your vinegar is pushing this behavioural change. Yeah. You will stop doing this. You will start doing this. Sure, yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And uh, number five, gather and listen to feedback. Mm -hmm. So I think this is this is part of the fundamental conditions of communication. Yeah. So the three fundamental conditions of communication is transmit, receive, and understand. So you can't sort of push something through and then sit back, get the cigars out and just ignore what everybody's saying. Somebody's jumping up and down saying, iceberg, iceberg. You're the captain of the Titanic going, really? What? Yeah, you, you're, you're dreaming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got to take that feedback back. And not only that, but it, it sort of allows people to sort of have a little bit more trust and a little bit more faith. If, if, you're, if, you're, if, if the thing that they're feeding back is saying this isn't quite working, well, we've got to understand that if we want to nudge people uh, in the future, well, we've got to address the shortcomings now. Sure. So, yeah, a bit of feedback. This thing's working here. This needs a bit of attention. Well, let's have a look at that then because that's going to keep it going and, and you're not just sort of abandoning things to, to take its own course. Mm -hmm. Number six, remove barriers to change adoption. Mm -hmm. Remove barriers to change slash which isn't there. It's an invisible slash yeah. adoption. Yeah. So, yeah, when we start thinking about these things that stop us, the, as we've seen earlier on with the trainers, mm. if I've got to squat down, if I've got to stand on my tiptoes, if I've got to ask okay. an assistance, assistant for um, a set of steps or whatever, then that's friction. Mm. That's slowing things down. Yeah. Whereas if you, can, if you can put something on there to smooth that path, um, then that's and and you've got to identify some of these things when we say when we say remove barriers to change. Yeah, we're preempting what people are going to come out what what things people are going to come out with that's going to stop this change from happening or at least not as it, not allow the change to happen in the way that we would like it to change. Sure. So we're preempting the problems that people will have. Yeah. Um, and bearing in mind, these are people who maybe in our organisation were subject matter experts. They've done the job for years. Mm -hmm. So when we um, implement or we, we try and implement a, a change within that organisation, they're going to be the people who witness that change firsthand. Um, and they may very well, through their, their expertise and experience, be able to sort of go, right, if this is happening, we should do this. Yeah. yeah. So we can even, we, when we're gathering that feedback where we said we're number five, this is number six, removing those barriers. He's taking those that feedback and doing something about it. Yeah, he's taking those those thoughts, those um, objections mm -hmm. from the team. Yeah. Yeah, which are causing the barriers. We're addressing them. We're speaking back to them. We're, we're, we're giving them a view of what changes we're willing to do to adopt to their foreseen change of moving forward as yeah. a result of what they've come back with. So the case study is, this is what's good, this is what's bad, this is what we need to continue with. Mm. And as a result of what's bad, we're now going to start to deal with those obstacles for the staff so that we can now continue and move forward. Yeah. And bearing in mind that at certain stages, you're going to have somebody turn around and go, you said we were going to do this, but now you're changing your mind. Because now we're starting to potentially have certain people who they just want to kick sandcastles over. It doesn't matter if you, uh, you, 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 you smooth the way and get rid of the pinch points and, and get rid of any friction. Right. There are potentially certain people who just want to kick sandcastles over. These are the people with their arms folded and the bottom lip out, not doing it. Right. Yeah. 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 Just going to spend the next five years spinning wheels until I get my pension. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. I've had a few of those. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we're going to have those, but we can't allow those to sort of derail everything because when we start talking, and particularly when you mentioned there about sort of commitment and accountability and results, mm. obviously that's linking back to Patrick Blencioni's five dysfunctions. Yeah. So um, if we've got that commitment and we've got that accountability, well, we can come back to that that sort of positive conflict and, and ultimately that psychological safety. Sure. We're talking about that trust, aren't we? Mm -hmm. um, so there's going to be certain people who, who may not have that, but we've got to focus on that, right? Okay, we need to be agile and flexible. 
Uh, so we're, we've we've anticipated that this is going to work. However, we've got a pinch point here or a bit of friction there. So let's drop on that, address it. And um, we might have to jump a little bit here. We might have to jink a little bit there. But we're still on course to achieve what we want to achieve in the way we want to achieve it. Yeah. Um, and the destination is still the destination. Yeah. 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 Um, the plan is still the plan. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, we've got sustained change adoption by celebrating short-term wins. Now, I really sort of thought about this and I thought, yeah, it's, it's just these acknowledgements. When we say celebrating wins, we're not sort of saying, a shipment of paper clips have come in. Way party, down the pub. <laughs> we're not talking about that. We're sort of saying, well, actually, it's got to be acknowledged. When people have, are part of it, when people are actually, you've given that nudge and, and, and they've made that choice and they've bought in and they've committed and, and they're making themselves accountable. When we get those wins, when we get the small wins, because ultimately we can't hold off everything, hold everything back until we achieve that major outcome, because that might be 18 months, three years down the line. But on that journey, we're going to have some wins, some small but wins. I feel like we're getting some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that needs to be fed back to the team and that needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. And I think that so many people are more than prepared to highlight shortcomings and failures and not recognise and celebrate the wins on the journey. Mm -hmm. in, in, in the a fictitious scenario we created for, yeah. for commitment, as an example, I asked the question, in relation to getting from A to Z and what you're individually dealing with at this moment in time with your team, how often do you sit down there at the end of the week and go, this is where we've got to, and these were the wins, and well done too, rather than, this is how far away we are from target. These are the things we have to fix and these are the things we have to get over. And they all went quiet. Right. So, okay. so do we focus more on what we haven't achieved and the potential negatives than what we have achieved and celebrating the small wins to keep everybody engaged? And we look at oxytocin, et cetera. How do we get there? How do we build this rapport, this this mm. sort of integ integrity of, of who we are and what we're doing as a team? Yeah. As well as you know, your dopamine and serotonin in mm. relation to drive, desire, all of that good stuff. Yeah. How do we do that? Because we can't do that by just re-emphasizing what we haven't done mm. and how we haven't done it well. Yeah. Because all that delivers, as we know, is cortisol and that gets people on the down. So if yeah. that's my Friday morning meeting, am I getting them revved up for the last day of the week or am I like dimming, dimming the light a bit? Mm. So there was like, that makes <clears> sense. <throat> and I said, well, we know it makes sense because you love to feel good about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah, you've all told me you love great feedback because that gets you thinking, I can go forward and I can do this job and I'm going to smash it out of the park. Yeah, so why do we talk about the negative rather than the good bits? And it only has to be a small part. It doesn't have to be a big yeah. So, yes, celebrations. <coughs> Very much, much a reward and recognition. I Very much linked to that challenge state of mindset and the brain chemicals that yeah. you alluded to. Great stuff. Excellent. So I think we've sort of explored a nudge theory. I'm, 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 I do apologize for any purists watching. We haven't gone to the pure nudge theory, but how does that, when we start thinking about nudge theory, how does that affect, what, what does that look like in, in other aspects other than pure nudge? Mm. Um, when we was sales, customer service, when we're talking about retail, when we're talking about production, when we're talking about influencing change, we can see that this nudge theory, we, it's, it's a really valuable thing to consider. Uh, when you want to get these these tangible outcomes, absolutely. And and if you if you're looking at real life everyday situations, if you think about the nudge theory, parenting, yes, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Scott Morrison. A pleasure. We must do this more often. Absolutely, Spencer. Thank you for your time. Great stuff. And we'll be back soon with another T2 Hubcast. So until then, bye bye now. Bye.